example we have reached on the subject of the second, the third Khalifa, Uthman ibn Affan, which is a enjoyable topic, but a difficult topic because most of us don't know very much about Uthman at all. And those who know about the story of Uthman find his entire life very controversial. Right? It's the opposite of Umar, where everybody pretty much says the same thing happened, or Abu Bakr, where everybody has the same account. Once, especially the death of Uthman ibn Affan, is clouded by a lot of controversy and what happened and according to whose account, who did what. Um, so inshallah, we'll try to unpack all of that. And today I'll keep better track of time, inshallah. So that way we're able to conclude with Salat al-Maghrib at um, 8.20, inshallah. So Uthman ibn Affan has many distinctions. Um, he's known in three different ways, primarily. Number one is that he's known that his entire life is connected with the Quran, right? Because he is a, a person who was there from the very beginning. He knows the circumstances of revelation. He memorized the Quran at, literally as it was revealed over the course of 23 years. And he was also one of the writers of the Quran. Um, uh, and so because he's one of the writers of the Quran, he is intimately connected with preserving the Quran. And then as the Khalifa, he oversaw the standardization of the Quran, the canonization right, of the Quran to a single version. And so his entire life is connected to the Quran. This is one way in which he's known. Another way in which he's known is being part of the family of the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He is known as the Nurain, right? The one who was given the two lights. So some people have said this is a reflection of the light of the Quran or other versions. But in all likelihood, it's a reference to the fact that he was married to two of the daughters of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. This is not explicitly stated, but it's kind of understood that it must be that uh, rather than any other explanation. That's the most convincing uh, account. And then uh, the third aspect, which is very special about Rahman ibn Affan, is his closeness to the Prophet وسلم, by virtue of being one of the first converts. In fact, he was the fourth person to convert to Islam. So these are three different ways. There are more than that, but these are the three main ways in which Rahman as a person is very, very special in the collective consciousness of Muslims. But unfortunately, most of us only know him, know him as the third Khalifa who was assassinated and he was very shy. But this is what we know about Rahman ibn Affan. But there is so much more, more to him. Part of why his life and his Khilafah is controversial is because he is one of the main descendants from Banu Abd Shams. Banu Umayyah, as we call it today, right? And so it later formed the Umayyad dynasty. And so from the very beginning, there was a little bit of tension between, we'll call it the old world order and the new world order. So the Prophet ﷺ, he started with the message, which put at the forefront people like the family of Yasir, right? Ammar ibn Yasir. It put at the forefront people like Bilal ibn Rabah, right? From Abyssinia of uh, Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, who came from the lower echelons of society, the lower level status. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud, Abu Huraira. These are the people who don't belong to very powerful tribes or very powerful families, but they, they attained high positions in society by virtue of their relationship with the Messenger Sallallahu But that doesn't mean that the old world order disappeared. Right? The Prophet Sallam, I kind of referred to this in the khutbah today that the old world order continued through the life of the Prophet and it continued um, during the Khilafah. And it actually is one of the main reasons, it's not the main reason, but it's one of the reasons that culminated in the Khilafah ending, which is that there was a power struggle. And one of the main power struggles was from the losers of the old world order, right? Whenever there's a change, there's some winners and there are some losers. Out of all of the tribes in, in Quraysh, Banu Hashim was very well respected, by the way, right? Because they were the descendants of Abdul Muttalib 
and Abd Manaf, right? And Abd Manaf, the children, they formed the different tribes, right? And so it was well regarded because these were the, the caretakers of the Kaaba. And they were the caretakers of Zamzam. That's a long story about the dream of, from the grandfather of the Prophet and rediscovering Zamzam after it had disappeared, right? And so they had a very high position in terms of respect. But in terms of power and influence, other ones like Umar's tribe, right? Uh, that we call Banu Adi, which was very famous for diplomacy and they were uh, ambassadors, they were very literate people. So they had a lot of influence. Bani Umayyah had even more influence than Bani Adi. And in most cases, the, the, the leaders of, uh, of Quraysh, the representatives from, from the house of Al-Nadwa, they would be from that tribe. So we can think of one famous person at the time of the life of the Prophet from Bani Umayyah. Give me one name. Right? Who was the leader at the time of Badr with the caravan? Who can we think of? And remember when the Prophet came to Mecca and he conquered it? He, he on the night of the conquest, he entered into Islam after fighting the Prophet for, for two decades. That is. Abu Sufyan. So Abu Sufyan is the most famous person from Bani Umayyah. And in fact, Abu Sufyan does not disappear. Abu Sufyan is one of those figures, just like Muawiyah, who people like to malign, right? Uh, because their descendants uh, uh, committed a lot of atrocities. But we should, we, if we, if so much as we can avoid that, uh, it's better. And the reason I say that is because these are companion sahaba that the Prophet ﷺ embraced and respected and, and he worked with and who the Prophet ﷺ confirmed are true believers. If their grandchildren did something wrong, we shouldn't blame them for that. They weren't even alive at the time that it happened, right? So it's unfair to blame somebody just because by virtue of their relationship. But this is what the Khilafah of Uthman brings up. Because Abu Sufyan is the close relative, actually the cousin of Uthman ibn Affan. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ and Uthman ibn Affan are almost second cousins, right? They're not exactly second cousins, but they're almost second cousins because they have a common relationship in the third, in the third generation. Right? And, and in fact, um, uh, there are other relatives, like from the mother of Uthman ibn Affan, who are even closer to the family of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and Habiba. Right. So there is a lot of overlap even between the Prophet sallam and Uthman ibn Affan even before his marriage, right, uh, to the two daughters of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But when we think of Bani Umayyah, we think of Abu Sufyan, we think of his son Muawiyah, we think of Yazid, we think of all the things that are going to happen later on in the Umayyad dynasty. We think of Marwan ibn Hakam, who later, I think, is the fourth um, Umayyad. Uh, and the Umayyad, they come one after another, right? Because they're all closer in age, right? So it's not like Omar, where you have like this huge period of time. Everything starts happening. After Uthman passes away, history is just like boom, boom, boom. One thing happens, you know, every year, everything changes suddenly. So Uthman ibn Affan, reversing a little bit back, he's this very powerful person and he is a complete exception to the rule. The Prophet comes with the message, we know Khadija is the first to embrace Islam. And then from the man, Abu Bakr is the first one. Then Umar, he converts much later, as we mentioned, after everybody has been called to it. But Umar was kind of doing his own thing. And the Prophet did not promote Islam to him until later. Right, once he was, it's like, okay, where's Omar? And then the Prophet ﷺ deliberately wanted Omar to find out about Islam, but of course, Allah has the best plan and caused everything to transpire that way. Uthman ibn Affan is the first recruit from Abu Bakr. He is the result of the da'wah of Abu Bakr. At least one to two dozen people embraced Islam directly because of the appeal of Abu Bakr. Which shows that it is a good thing, it's something encouraged from the Prophet to make a personal appeal, to tell somebody this is what Islam is, and then of course it will be up to them. 
if they're interested in tracing it or not. But Arthman, even though he seems like a very passive person, and we'll see how that plays out in history. In fact, he had no issue from the very beginning embracing Islam, even though it went against his father, it went against his society, it went against the whole status quo. And the reason was because Arthman followed a higher ethical framework. He was a person who had never worshipped an idol in his life. Just like uh, many of the other foremost of the companions, like Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, like Ali karamallahu anhu, right? all of them, they never worship idols because they were never satisfied. Right? It doesn't mean that they were worshipping Allah the way that the Prophet was, even before his message, but they were not worshipping idols. They never engaged in any of that behavior because they weren't satisfied uh, with that. He also never had a sip of alcohol in his entire life. Even before Islam, and by the way, deep into the message, Muslims, Sahaba, whose names we know, were consuming alcohol. We know this for a fact. When the revelation came down, of the, and this is the most famous example in the Quran of Tadrij, of gradual prohibition, right? It came in three phases. In fact, if you consider the general discouragement from the Prophet about alcohol, maybe you could say it came in four phases, but three in the Quran. Right? When that was revealed, people uh, broke the, their alcohol into the streets of Medina. So when you hear about that, what does that tell you? That means they had liquor in their houses. Right? You have to read into the hadith. You have to think about it a little bit. It's like, okay, well, if everybody's throwing out alcohol, that means they had some. right? And even many of the foremost sahaba, they did consume alcohol because it was permissible. Right? And the people in the society, were, they weren't ready for that prohibition of alcohol. But Uthman ibn Affan, from his fitrah, from his natural inclination to good things, he never engaged in any kind of debauchery. He wasn't interested in women. He wasn't interested in partying. He wasn't interested in music. He wasn't interested in any of those things. And he was so widely respected and beloved among Quraysh. In fact, his conversion came as a huge shock to everyone. In fact, one of the nursery rhymes, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not joking about this. They even had a song that mothers would sing to their babies that I love you as much as Quraysh loves Arthman. That was literally a line within a nursery rhyme. So it's like when, when you love somebody a lot, you tell them I love you as much as people love Arthman, right? Um, and it shows, you know, uh, the way in which he was kind of, you know, the, the prodigal child. He was that beloved child uh, because he was still young at the time of that conversion. There are only six years between the birth of the Prophet وسلم, and the birth of Uthman ibn Affan. So he was about 34 years old or 35 years old, probably 34, at the time of the message of the Prophet so he is still quite young, and that's why he is able to be the third Khalifa, because you have Abu Bakr, you have the Prophet, Abu Bakr, uh, you have Umar, and a long period of Umar. And now he's a very older man. So you have to view that within that context. So Uthman, I mentioned, he's the first cousin of Abu Sufyan. Muawiyah is his second cousin. He's the founder of the Umayyad dynasty. And a lot of the problems later on were because of tension between Bani Umayyah and Banu Hashim. Later on, we don't call them Banu Hashim. We call them the Abbasid dynasty. Because specifically, the people who disagreed uh, and had an issue with Bani Umayyah were the children of uh, Abbas. And there is a narrative among people that actually the conflict was between Ali radiallahu an, and Uthman. And this is not true. It's not shown by history in any way. In fact, Ali will talk about it later when he's about to be assassinated. His, he, Ali sends his two sons to the front of his house to protect Uthman ibn Affan. In fact, he was his main mediator in negotiating with the rebels. Was Ali radiallahu anhu. Was the most trusted advisor to Uthman. They disagreed for sure uh, on, on what should be done. But there was complete unbroken trust between Ali and Uthman. 
And that was also shown by Al Hassan Wal Hussein. So there was the, the tension mostly was between the Abbasid, who were the descendants of Abbas. It's the same family, right? From Banu Hashim and Bani uh, Umayyah. And so basically, Banu, uh, Banu Hashim, the Abbasid, they revolt against Bani Umayyah because, in, in reality, it's true. Historically, they were uh, being oppressed because it's a power struggle. Bani Umayyah has only one threat. Who is going to overthrow them? Only Banu Hashim. Because Bani Umayyah has all the power, but Banu Hashim has the support of the Republic. Right? Because people, they love the family of the Prophet. The idea of, 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 of uh, Sunni and Shia doesn't exist. Anybody who talks about Shia Ali, this is not history. This is something different. Because those names came later. At the time that we're talking about, those names don't exist. Most of the issues had to do with politics and who will be the leader. And uh, in fact, the opposition to Uthman ibn Affan had nothing to do with supporting Ali. Even though there was a lot of support for Ali, the people who assassinated Uthman ibn Affan were upset about his rule. They were upset about their, their power. But in fact, they were not supporters of Ali. And some people... They start to re revise history to make like a very neat story, but that's actually not supported by history. And so uh, what ended up happening is he embraced Islam, Uthman ibn Affan, and he became a part of that inner circle that the Prophet wasallam trusted. And then the Prophet wasallam proposed to him in fact, this is one of the lost sun sunnas, right? Traditionally, in, in early Islam and in the early Islamic generations, uh, fathers would make proposals uh, to the groom for their daughter. This is the Islamic tradition, right? Because people they talk about following the sunnah. So actually, the fathers would be proactive in finding a suitable match. So this is considered from the duty and the responsibility of the father. And there are a lot of hadith to support what I'm saying, even though it's not the top of it, right? And that's why in actually the, the, the nikah contract, so the ijab, it usually comes from the wali, from the, from the girl side first, and the kabul, the acceptance is from the groom. The groom is accepting the proposal. And this is exactly what happened in, in the case of Uthman ibn Affan, that the Prophet proposed that he should marry uh, Ruqayya, and so he uh, married uh, Ruqayya, the, one of the daughters of the Prophet. So Ruqayya and Umm Kulthum, they were only one year apart. Right? And so, uh, and I think many of us, we know the description. He was of the average height, he was very thin. Um, some people, uh, you know, he had a very, he didn't have a big stature because he was a normal height, very thin man, he had a heavy beard. But he had long fingers, long joints, and he had a very distinguished look, right? And at that time, and he had very long hair. And that was very normal. Umar also had long hair. The Prophet ﷺ had long, when I say long hair, I mean hair that reached just to above the shoulder. A lot of people aren't aware, but actually that was the normal hairstyle at the time, in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ had shorter hair, and sometimes he had longer hair. But actually, if people are following the, the sunnah, right? People use the word sunnah in different ways. Some of the things are from adat, from the habits. They don't mean that you have to do exactly what the Prophet ﷺ. He never wore sneakers. If you want to wear sneakers, go ahead. You know, you don't have to wear some old chapel just because you think, okay, this is the one that the Prophet ﷺ used to do, unless if the thing has some kind of benefit or some kind of ritual uh, significance. So he lived to the age of 80, and over the course of 50 years, he married eight women. Two of them are the daughters of the Prophet وسلم, both of them who passed away, and both of them were actually promised to the daughters of Abu Lahab. And as a result of the message of the Prophet وسلم, Abu Lahab, in a very public and in a very insulting way, uh, canceled 
the marriage proposals for both of them, for his two sons. Because Abu Lahab, this is within the family of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that was, that was customary at the time that people would talk about marriage years ahead of time. And then much later on, when they're adults, then they would get married, they would have this ceremony, and then they would start their life. You know, like the subhanan, we say, like the rukhsati will happen later. So in Arabic, they will say the nikah, the consummation of the marriage, that will happen uh, later. He ended up having nine sons, four daughters, but none of them were the descendants of the Prophet, except for Abdullah. And Abdullah passed away at the age of, of about, about six. Um, he received an injury and he succumbed to that injury. And so he did not survive that. Which also suggests that there is a divine hikmah, there is a divine wisdom in the fact that the Prophet ﷺ did not have any male heirs and that he did not have any descendants, direct descendants, other than through Fatima. Right, and through Al Hassan and Al Hussein. So, of course, there must be a reason for that. Of course, people have different views, but from the perspective of, uh, of the Ahl Sunnah, it's a matter of opinion, I would say. It's not a matter of right or wrong, but from the perspective of the Sunni thought, that it's indicative that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet وسلم, don't want leadership to be concentrated only within his lineage. So what is incumbent on Muslims is to show love and respect and appreciation and kindness to Ahlul Bayt, right? So love of Ahlul Bayt is part of our Iman. This is part of our love for the Prophet But it doesn't, in the Sunni thought, it doesn't have any religious significance. That So if somebody is a Sayyid or somebody is from the descendants of the Prophet and they said, oh, no, when you pray, you should put your hands here. So it's great that they're from the family of the Prophet. It doesn't mean what they're saying is right. right? That, that doesn't mean that they have some kind of religious or political uh, authority. The scholars, they said the reason that he did not marry until he was close to 40 is because he was so shy. He was so shy, even the angels were shy with him. Right? This is as many have heard about Uthman ibn Affan. Right? He was very modest, very humble, very simple person. And people say that because of that, all of his marriages, not a single one of them did he make the proposal. Okay? So every single time, it was the woman who proposed to him. And that's why he didn't marry until the Prophet went to him and made that proposal. Because in that time, getting married in your late 30s was something very unusual, right? People after 40 were considered a sheikh, right? Nowadays, you know, 60 is still young. I mean, that's what I think, especially, mashallah. No, really, I'm serious. Um, you know, nowadays, um, thanks to health and medicine and the norms that we live in today, people live much, much longer than they did in the time of the Prophet And so we no longer think of the age of 40 as having any significance, right? You know, because people who are in their 50s and their 60s, I mean, you see people in their 70s and beyond who are living very active lives. But that was not the case at that time. And so it was unusual that he married uh, later. So as we mentioned, he's the fourth person. He's associating with the Quran. And um, actually, there's, a, there's one hadith that we have to mention, which is reported by Abu Musa al-Ash'ari, that the, he was with the Prophet وسلم, and they were inside of a garden, and there was a knock at the door of the garden. The Prophet said, this man, open the door, this is a man from Jannah. So he goes to the door, who does he find? Not Uthman yet, we're getting to Uthman. He doesn't get a free pass. Abu Bakr. Abu Bakr the line appears. Then they continue. There's a second knock. This is one of the people of Jannah. Who's next? Umar radiallahu anhu. Then there's a third knock. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, this is from the people of Jannah, but not until 
he is mubtala until he is afflicted with a calamity, meaning in this world. So he has to go through a lot of hardship and then he's going to go into death. And the person enters, he is Uthman ibn Affan, and the Prophet tells him what was said. You know, so they said, Oh, this is what the Prophet said about you. And he thanks Allah, you know, Alhamdulillah, as they all said that. And then he says, Wallahu al-Musta'an. And Allah is going to be my help and my assistance in whatever is going to transpire. So he's already received information from the Prophet that he is going to receive a lot of difficulty and he's going to have a lot of hardship. In fact, on one occasion, the Prophet was climbing on the mountain of Uhud. And with him was Abu Bakr and Umar and Uthman. Some people say Jabal Rahman, but Jabal Uhud is stronger, or it could be both, or it could be the narrator sometimes. They get mixed up from one mountain to another. Most likely it's both, right? but the story happened twice. So they're both there, and the mountains start shaking. And the Prophet, as we know, the Prophet uh, from his miracles, he used to talk to the tree, he talked to the mountain. So here he told the mountain of Ahud that, uh, that calm down, right, and relax. Because on you is a Nabi, is a prophet, and a Siddiq. So who's the Siddiq? That's Abu Bakr. And Shahidan. So who are the two shaheeds? Umar an and Uthman. So we know about Abu Lubaba, right? The one, Abu Lu'lu, the one who assassinated Umar an, the Persian uh, slave who uh, assassinated Umar. We talked about that last week. And now Uthman ibn Affan, who is assassinated by the rebels, specifically the rebels from Egypt, right? So he is also assassinated as well. So the Prophet ﷺ had given them this news. So they were not surprised. They were expecting that it's not going to be smooth sailing. So Uthman ibn Affan, we're not going to talk about his life during the time of the Prophet ﷺ because that was covered in the seerah, which you guys did already. And then he is one of the people who's entrusted by Abu Bakr when he travels on expeditions. And Uthman especially entrusted Ali when he goes to Jerusalem. I'm, I'm sorry, he entrusts Uthman ibn Affan when he goes to Jerusalem, right? And when he travels on the expedition. So he left Uthman as, an, as a deputy, Khalifa, right? To be in charge and to manage the affairs of the central government and of Medina while he's gone. Then in the time of, of uh, Umar, an, he knows that he's dying because there's some a time period that passes in which he succumbs to his injuries. And he forms a council of six people, right? And long story short, two go for Ali, two go for Uthman, and now the two are remaining. And Abdullah ibn Zubair, he was missing at the time. They make the, they, they put the, they can agree on the six thing. Alhamdulillah, so they got the six thing. But now they need to get the six council to agree on who the Khalifa should be. So Abdullah ibn Zubair is like the tiebreaker. It's reported that he went through Medina. He spent several days asking everybody who he would talk to. He would talk to women. He would talk to elderly people. He would talk to the young. And he would say, well, who do you think should be the Khalifa? Who should you think should be the Khalifa? So people who uh, adopt the view that Islam uh, promotes democracy or promotes um, pluralism, they use this as an example. Which I think is actually, if you look at the four Khalifas, each one became the Khalifa in a different way. So if you study the Khulafa al-Rashidun, you'll come to one conclusion, which is that there is no standardized way according to the religion. And this is a blessing because had the Prophet said, oh, you have to have a leader like this, we'd be stuck with it forever. Right? So imagine if if, if the example of the sunnah from the Prophet ﷺ is that, oh, you have your Khalifa, just listen to whatever they said. We would be stuck with tyrants, right? We would be stuck with dictators. So that means that as societies change, as the circumstances change, then you can, there's more than one way. It's not a single way. It depends on the circumstances and the people at the time. But in the case of Uthman ibn Affan, it was a very, a democratic style way of selecting Uthman ibn Affan. So then he becomes the Khalifa. 
there were still a lot of grumbling. Because he became the Khalifa by a hair, by a margin, a very small margin. The reason that he became Khalifa is because he's the middle guy. He's the compromise candidate, right? He's the Mitt Romney, okay? Because he's, you know, he's a nice guy, you know, he has good family values, but nobody's excited about him, right? I mean, this is the reality, right? So the people from, from, from Bani Umayyah, they want somebody really strong. They want somebody really aggressive. Uthman ibn Affan is not that guy. And on the other hand, there are the people from Banu Hashim um, who are closer to the family of the Prophet وسلم, and especially from the Ansar. The Ansar are close to the family of the Prophet وسلم, and they have their own candidates as well. So they're on the opposite side. So they have their own candidates. So nobody got what they want. So this is, this is not a good way to start your rule. Right? Nobody's excited about you ruling. But he's such a great person, he's such a nice person, he starts with a lot of goodwill. However, he adopts some policies which are very bad. Yeah. So Umar ibn Khattab, عن, what he used to do is he would give the governors a lot of latitude. He would promote people like Abu Ubaidah, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas in, in, in Persia. People with famous names who, who are very close to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he gives them high positions, he gives them authority, and what he does is he delegates to them. So he says, whatever conquest, whatever wealth, whatever power, whatever arms, whatever spoils from war that you accumulate, they're yours for the local population. Uthman ibn Affan, he is spending money in moving westward from Egypt into Africa, west and south. In Central Asia, the, the lands they entered into Anatolia into Turkey. They started moving into Armenia and Azerbaijan, then into Central Asia, and all of Persia is now within the rule of the Khilafah at this point. They have not entered into what they call Khorasan. What's Khorasan today? Uh, well, after Khorasan is, nowadays we will, we used to call it Iran, but now what do we call it? We call it Afghanistan, right? Khorasan is Afghanistan. We didn't call it Afghanistan at that time. The borders are totally different, but it's not the whole of Afghanistan, right? So part of Afghanistan, this is Khorasan on the Persian speaking side, right? So this did not, this happens a little bit later. So, but they're right there. So people are starting to hear about Islam. Islam also did not enter Sindh yet. Right? This happens in the time of the Tabi'een. Muhammad ibn al-Qasim al thaqafi specifically, he is the one before any armies did not enter into Sindh. They never entered into Pakistan, right? But they started to learn about Islam because Islam reached into Persia. And then there were some of the Tabi'een and the Tabi'i Tabi'een that started to promote Islam, especially in the beginning of Pakistan, in the Sindh region, not the whole of Pakistan. So this happened very, very early in the time of, of Islam, right? Because the rest of India, this is way, way, way later. Right, this is not even until you get closer to the Mughal Empire. But that region, Afghanistan and, and parts of Pakistan, they started to receive this message that, oh, there's this religion of Islam. And that's because the influence of Persia started to decline. And the Zoroastrian religion, uh, Sabian religion at the time, it started uh, to decline. So now what there's money coming in, there is more lands that's coming under their influence, especially in Africa especially in Egypt. Um, Uthman ibn Affan, he starts a naval fleet, especially in Alexandria, is now under the Muslims. This is a very, very important Byzantine Roman city because this gives you control and access of the Mediterranean, right? Sinai, Palestine, that's part of Sham, all of Iraq, all of, uh, of Iran, it's uh, Persia, it's all covered. But what he does is he says, send all the money to Medina to form the central government and the central Bayt al -Mah. This causes a lot of people to be disgruntled because all of that power and influence is all concentrated within Uthman ibn Affan and his inner circle. And his inner circle, he replaced all the governors with people from that same tribe of Banu Umayyah. And people, they ask the question, and a lot of the Sahaba, including Aisha radiallahu anha, 
was very much opposed to this. And there were some other Sahabi, uh, Sahaba um, who were also very vocal against it. And they tried to appeal to, to, to Uthman and tried to convince him that he should change his political policy. They're not opposed to him on religious grounds. They're opposed to him on a political ground, which is that you're favoring a kind of nepotism, that you're favoring Bani Umayya over the other. Now you could look at it the other way, which is that Uthman ibn Affan is now ruling a huge empire and he needs people who are gonna give him complete loyalty, right? He needs rulers, he needs people who he can trust. So this is another way of looking at it. This is to the motivation why Uthman ibn Affan did that. And then, so there started to be some opposition, some rebel groups, right? from Egypt, from Kufa, from Basra, and they start assembled. Then people, some of the companions, they start to write letters. Their original intention was to, was to start a protest movement, not to overthrow and not to assassinate Ahmad ibn Affan. The idea was to put more pressure on Ahmad ibn Affan because the abuses were not by him. The abuses were by the people he selected, right? And he, as a Khalifa, he can easily remove them and put somebody different, and the problem would have been solved. But he was heavily influenced by Marwan. Marwan ibn al-Hakam, from within his family, right, and the family of Muawiyah, was kind of behind Uthman ibn Affan and telling him what to do. Ali radiallahu an, he tried because they have a very close relationship. They were very close friends. Altogether, these companions, he tried to advise him. In fact, he was the main mediator. They came and Uthman ibn Affan, he gave some, some guarantee that he's going to change some policy and they went away. But in fact, not much changed. Then they came back and Ali radiallahu an, he quit. He said, I'm not getting through this. It's not working. Even though Ali radiallahu an, so he went home and he disappeared. Then the protesters who had come back they actually created an uh, embargo around the house of Uthman ibn Affan. They surrounded the whole house. They did not let him leave. And then they escalated it and they, um, they refused to provide him with any water. So then Ali ibn Abi Talib and also some other companions, they came to rescue Uthman ibn Affan, not because they agreed with the policy, but because they wanted to protect him from being harmed. And he insisted, he, Ali, he, talked to the protesters and insisted they should provide him with water and they should allow him access, which they didn't do. And so Ali, he sent his sons, Al-Hassan and Al-Hussein, in order to defend and protect Uthman ibn Affan because it became clear that there's a real possibility for some violence. A couple of days later, I think maybe one day later, there was a fire that was put in the front of the house of Uthman ibn Affan and there was some violence. When Uthman went out, the people who were trying to advise Uthman and the rebels and the protesters, they ended up having, there was a stone that was thrown, somebody was killed, then the other people started to attack, and then there were there was some loss of life. After this happened, then some of the protesters who came from Egypt attacked the back of the house of Uthman ibn Affan. And they found that Uthman ibn Affan and his wife were there. And he was in the middle of reciting Quran. Of course he was reciting Quran. Right, from the people of Quran. And they, they struck him with the, with the arrow. And they assassinated him. And according to the accounts of the companions and the historical accounts that are from, we see from Al-Waqidi, Ibn Ishaq and others, he was uh, uh, attacked and the, and the blood from his recitation spilled over onto the Qur'an. So he literally died while holding the Qur'an, which is apt because Uthman ibn Affan was a memorizer of the Qur'an. He was a protector of the Qur'an. He was a writer from the scribes of the Prophet And during his Khilafah, one of the most important things, if not the most important thing that he did, was he standardized the Quran because there were different recitation in Asham and in Iraq. So in Iraq, most of them were not Arabic speakers. So when we think of Iraq, we're like, oh, 
is Arabic. But at that time, right, when we think of Iraq, most of Iraq is Al Hira and it's mostly Persian. Some of Iraq is Arabic. Most of Iraq, pretty much all of it, is not Arabic speaking. Same with Egypt, right? We think of Egypt, we think of it as an Arab country. These are Musta'araba, these are Arabized. <laughs> this is a very controversial subject. Right? These are Arabized, you know, just let the Prophet and he said, whoever speaks Arabic is Arab, right? So this is the reality that these concepts of identity are very clear, right? So we're not telling who's Arab and who's not Arab. What I'm saying is at that time, right, that this, these were not considered Arab lands. And so there were some different dialects and different pronunciation that entered into the recitation of the Quran. So Uthman ibn Affan, he took the Quran of Hafsa. That was the official Quran at the time. And he ordered that multiple copies of it should be transcribed, should be dictated. They were written, they were distributed throughout the Muslim land. And he ordered that every other version of the Quran should be wiped out, should be erased, it should be burnt. And so as a result of that, uh, the Quran was standardized. And Orientalists, of course, they have a lot of fun with the story. They say, oh, this is when the Quran was changed. And this is, the reason they say that is because they don't have any concept of an oral <laughs> The Quran, is not a written transmission. It is an oral transmission. Like I mentioned before, there are more than 11 million people in the world who have memorized the Quran. The majority of the people who have memorized the Quran are not Arabic speakers. This is a fact, right? Out of all of the Ummah, about 18% uh, of them are Arabic speakers. Less than 25%, about 23% are from the Middle East, and less than 18% of Muslims speak Arabic. And when you look at the Quran, the reciters of the Quran, the majority of them are not Arabic. So you cannot get every single person in the world to agree to change the Quran. Because the Quran is transmitted to a, a group of people, to a group of people, to a group of people, to a group of people, it becomes impossible for them to all to agree on this guidance. And so as a result, Osman ibn Affan, who was assassinated, We'll talk, there was a lot of drama, but we're going to leave all of that for next week's discussion, inshallah, when we talk about Ali bin Abi Talib, radiallahu anh. But it's important for us to remember that none of the controversy that transpired surrounding the Uthman ibn Affan and his political, if you'll allow me, his political missteps, right? Because these are political errors or miscalculations. These hit some decisions in order to, what he thought will create stability, what will create order, that will preserve the ummah for the next Khalifa. But in fact, it actually backfired and it caused more division. That does not detract from his accomplishments. It does not detract from the magnanimity of his personality, his, high, his very high ethical standards and his love for the Prophet and for his family. And so we shouldn't take those political missteps and repackage it as a conflict between Uthman and Ali, because this has no basis, or between Uthman and between Banu Hashim. Because this will happen, but it didn't happen that time. That's not what was happening at that time. So with that, inshallah, we'll open up. Uh, I see there uh, some chat. OK, this is about the sound. Uh, so, inshallah, there was a question about leaving the Zoom on after Salah for Q&A. We're going to do the Q&A now, and we'll conclude with the Salah, inshallah. So, uh, we'll spend five minutes or so, or so inshallah, to address the question. Sisters in Islam. You know, this story is tricky because the majority of the Ummah was against Uthman ibn Affan. And most of the prominent Sahaba were against Uthman ibn Affan. That's true, right? Most of the names that we know, they all were telling Uthman that we should change what he was doing, that it was a mistake. But there were a few of them who turned the protest in a violent way. And according to the historical accounts, right, who knows if they're authentic, 
those are the protesters who came from India. And there was uh, there was money involved, right? So money's money also involved, right? And so those protesters assassinated him. We know some of the names of who they were, the rebels, and they were Muslim. And one of the common themes of, of what we see from this period in the period of Ali ibn Abi Talib is that there is an emerging philosophy of Khawarij. I don't know if you've heard this term of Khawarij. So the Khawarij, they don't exist yet. They are about to form. But these are the early thinking of Khawarij. That, so for example, their delegate goes to Ali in the mediation and, and, and Uthman and Uthman says, by what right are you fighting me? I'm the Khalifa, right? Why are you fighting me? And they said, the Quran says, Udina lilladina yuqatiluna, right? Uh, so Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah that permission has been granted for them to fight because they have been, zulm is being done, right? So because they are oppressed. Uthman bin Affan says, I know when this ayah was revealed and also the circumstances when it was revealed because of course he was there. And he says, this is the first ayah in Surah Baqarah that allowed us to fight because we were oppressed by the Quraysh. So this is an ayah not about Muslims fighting Muslims, but this is about Muslims fighting oppression from the Mushrikeen. But the Khawarij, they started this tradition of misquoting the Quran. Ali radiallahu anhu, he, he had a saying, he said, if I lost my camel, I will find an ayah in the Quran to support, tell me where the camel is. What is he saying? He's saying, you can always find a hadith. You can always find an ayah of the Quran to support whatever you think. If you want to say the moon is purple, you'll find an ayah for it. Right? So this is not how knowledge works. Right? You, you take the knowledge from the people of knowledge. Right? Based on Asani. Based on links of transmission. So they were Muslims, but they were following a philosophy which is, um, which is that which is based on Muslims fighting Muslims and that the ends justify the means. So they felt that they would be able, that they were justified because Uthman was making a mistake. So therefore they could do anything and they could have a violent uh, rebellion against them. Even though the Sahaba like Ali عن, and the other prominent Sahaba, they said, no, we should talk to him. We should convince him to change. And he's a very old, very frail man who only has a certain amount of time left on earth to begin with. But no, they wanted to make a point that the Khalifa, he has to answer uh, to all of us. There are a couple of questions here. What happened to the assassins? This, inshallah, we're going to talk about. This is a huge story about what happens. We will call it the investigation, right? Because there's a big debate about the investigation about the assassination of Uthman. This happens during the Khilafah of Ali Radulan, so that's for next week. So we have to come back for that. What is the main lesson we can learn from these events? I think what it shows is that even the Sahaba were not immune from politics, right? And that politics can corrupt people. They, all of the Sahaba, they behaved well. And you're going to see later in Ali, you have the battle of Al-Jama. That even there were conflicts within the Sahaba. So we love all of the companions. All of them are reliable. All of them are good. They're the best of generations. But even the Sahaba, they can make political mistakes. Right? So this is one of the big lessons from the time of Uthman. The other thing we can learn is that even though there's violence and there's conflict, you see the nobility, the foresight, the wisdom of Ali. And Al-Hasan and al -Hasan. So this is another thing that we can admire. And we see that again and again, Al Hassan, for example, he refuses to fight Muawiyah. We're going to talk about that later. And that the, the family of the Prophet prefer, even though when they are right, they still prefer to go with the tyrant and the dictator and to show opposition, but show opposition without a violent rebellion. That there's a third way. You can, you can show your opposition in the form of, of like a rebellion in a way that it's going to lead to a lot of bloodshed. So I think this is one of the main lessons that we can learn. And what happened to the assassin of Umar an, So that's simple. So they knew exactly who it was. It's considered what we call now like a lone wolf. They did an investigation at the time of Umar an, 
and people they couldn't figure it out. Was it because he was mad because of Persia? Was it because of a personal vendetta? In the end, they, he wouldn't talk, right? Because he was, he was, he was killed immediately. So they weren't able to find out what it was. But from the context, we understood that it was because he was upset about the prestige of Persia being diminished. And that was the reason that he was, uh, he took that step against. Do we have any other questions? Yeah. Okay. What we can learn from this concept is two concepts which are very difficult to implement. One is that the early companions understood that the Pakistan had not dictated that who should The only reason that that Arthman, um, uh, the only reason that Omar was selected was because Abu Bakr, the Sahaba, insisted that Abu Bakr should make that selection. Otherwise, Abu Bakr would consciously would not do so. Although in the in the Shia texts they say that the Prophet asked for a piece of paper. And they say which is authentic that the Prophet asked for this piece of paper. So the Shia uh, school of thought, let's say the Itna Ashriya, the Twelver, Zaidi, their opinion is that the Prophet intended to write the name of Ali on that piece of paper. But everybody agrees that he never actually did that. But that they say that he wanted to. So the Prophet intentionally did not name a successor. Abu Bakr didn't want to do it. Uh, Omar never did it. Uthman never did it. So that means that the matter is open to the community. It's up to the society to decide who is best qualified. That can be done through elections. It can be done through selection. It can be done through a nomination process. But Islam does not dictate this process. In my view, I think history has shown that democracy is the most effective way of choosing. That's my personal view. I could be wrong. But Islam doesn't tell us which is the best way. So whatever I said, that's my own personal view. And another person is entitled to their own personal view, and that could be correct. But I think from my study of history, the top-down approach has failed as society becomes more complicated. And it has. we've seen that tyranny creates a lot of oppression. The second thing that we learn from the from the Khulafa is um, is that um, in the in the succession is that the Khalifa is meant to be the religious leader as much as the political leader. And Dr. Tariq mentioned this two weeks ago as well. That the Khalifa used to, or three weeks ago, I'm sorry, when he said that the Khalifa used to personally deliver the khutbah. And the Khalifa used to personally lead the prayer in the masjid. And so the Khalifa used to personally give fatwa and make decisions that have a religious consequence for the people. This is very, very difficult to implement because usually the people that want political leadership are usually the least qualified religious leaders. And those who are the most qualified religiously usually want to have nothing to do with politics. Um, so this is very hard to implement. But those are two things that we can learn in terms of political succession. Uh, there's a question on Zoom that the Quran is put together by Abu Bakr, radiallahu an. So the suhuf of Abu Bakr is what I talked about as the copy of Hafsa. So this is the same, the same thing. So this is uh, has to do with this is different from, and then it was copied into six copies by Uthman. So these are actually two different things, right? It's exactly as uh, as the comment mentioned, that it was compiled. So Abu Bakr, this is the compilation of the Quran because it was in pieces. So then they created one master copy. Of the Quran. And also they created a master copy that others could copy the whole of the Quran. But in the time of Uthman, they did it because they had a problem with inconsistent uh, copies. It's not that people were changing ayahs. No, 
but they were changing the pronunciation of words, the diacritical. They didn't have fatha, bamma, kasra, noon, ba. They didn't have dots. They didn't have those kind of violations. So they needed to standardize the Quran, and that happened at the time of our time. So uh, there's another question. What you said about those who seek leadership are those least capable applied to our situation in this country, those who we elect. I mean, that was my personal view that sometimes the people who seek leadership is uh, as Imam al-Ghazali talks about that love of leadership, that thirst for power is one of the diseases of the heart. But at the same time, that process allows us to vet those people, right? Because then we choose the people, if we don't have another process, it's still political. The people who say, oh, election, democracy is terrible because then you promote people who want that position. Well, what other process do you have? And are you going to choose somebody who's not interested? Some of the uh, societies, organizations, people get pushed into the position. Then when they have the position, they don't take it seriously because they didn't want it in the first place. So it's a very good question about who we should elect, but I'm the least qualified to answer that question. This is something that a political scientist would be better suited to, to answer that question. But religiously, Islam does not tell us that it has to be a certain way. So when somebody says, is Islam pro-democracy, is Islam anti-democracy, should the Khalifa be appointed or not? My study of the Sharia is that you're not going to find that answer. That as long as it is consistent with the Quran and the Sunnah, then it is acceptable. If it is not consistent, then it's not acceptable. So we'll stop there, inshallah. Barakallahu li wa lakum. May Allah bless you and myself. May Allah increase us in knowledge and enter us into al firdaus May Allah also have mercy on the soul of Amr Iqbal uh, Qadir, who died in an in a accident in Islamabad at the age of 25 years. May Allah enshroud him in his mercy, allow him to enter al firdaus the highest levels of the Jannah, and give his family patience. May Allah cause all of us to be joined in Al-Jannah in the company of the Messenger of Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.